Hi everyone. I'm oh, sorry. Um, uh, welcome to our fourth session of Discover DH. Um, for those of you who haven't been to the earlier ones, this is a 10-week series in which um, essentially we're going through different topics um, and questions in the digital humanities. Um, this is one of our hack sessions, so we're going to be, uh, as opposed to yak sessions where we talk, um, we're going to be doing some hands-on with Boyant, which Abby uh, Shield, one of our humanities librarians, is going to teach us about. Um, and without here's Abby. Hi. Thank you, Sarah. So hello, everybody. Um, like Sarah said, my name is Abby. I'm one of our humanities librarians. And today's uh, workshop is about text analysis and visualization. Um, we will, this is a hands-on exercise, so you guys all have computers. Um, if you haven't done so um, already, I'll have you install uh, the tool that we'll be using, um, or one version of the tool that we'll be using uh, shortly. But I thought we'd actually start with uh, some basics. Um, start with just what is uh, text analysis, a little bit of a, um, a definition. Um, so just as a basic definition, we have text analysis is the process of sorting and analyzing data contained in text for research purposes. And I uh, will give full credit right now to Bonnie Santos, who has put together a guide for us, a research guide to text analysis, because I heard that straight from her guide. Um, I thought we'd, uh, we'd stay uh, consistent. That is a really great guide. It has lots of uh, handy resources, including a lot of documentation and information on Voyant, the uh, tool that we'll be using uh, in a little bit. If you look at this, uh, uh, this definition, right now it actually it's not necessarily uh, uh, just digital humanities based. Not, it's not necessarily tied to a computer because you can analyze text um, with you know your, your your eyes, you can do this uh, in a very traditional way of picking up a text and reading it and kind of uh, uh, breaking it down. The only thing is that maybe you know you don't talk about talk about data necessarily when you talk about say literary studies uh, uh, in the traditional sense. But for the most part, um, that could apply to to all forms of textual analysis or literary um, analysis. Today we are going to be focusing on computer-aided uh, text analysis specifically. Um, and while we're talking about the, the scope, I'll also say um, text analysis is not just something that you do in the humanities um, or with, uh, uh, say, literary text, um, which is what I think is often, often talked about. Uh, you can do it with any kind of text. It could be you know, tweets, it could be a collection of blog posts, it could be uh, government documents, um, any kind of text. Uh, but since this is part of the Discovering DH series, uh, Discovering Digital Humanities series, and I am a humanities librarian, I am going to focus um, on humanities uh, examples today. Um, I also have a few other terms up on the slide that you might have encountered um, when you, if you've looked into text analysis at all. One of them is text mining. Um, I'm not going to fully define it today, but I would say um, Text mining is often used synonymously with text analysis, uh, but it, I think more than text analysis, it does imply kind of um, uh, the use of a computer to kind of study a really large body um, of data, uh, whereas text analysis tends to be a, a little bit, a little bit more flexible. Um, so a couple other terms that you may have come across uh, with text analysis um, really have to do with uh, questions of scale. So often text analysis is described as a distant reading um, of a large body of text, whereas the traditional form of, say, literary scholarship, where you take a poem and you go line by line and you break it down, is, um, is looked at as close reading. Um, that's not really, that, I wouldn't view it uh, uh, so much of, uh, as that kind of a dichotomy. It's not either or. More and more people are doing it, uh, doing text analysis as both and. And computers can help you with distant reading, they can help you with close reading, they can help you with um, everything in between. Um, the term that I uh, really like is actually differential reading, which is a process that involves you know, scaling in and scaling out, uh, starting maybe with a 10,000 foot view and then going down to the very you know, um, uh, close reading uh, uh, view 
and sort of using each different form of analysis to help you generate more questions, uh, more avenues of research that then maybe take you from a distant reading down to, to a very uh, uh, close reading of a text. Um, do you have, the next question that people often ask me is, okay, so what, what do you do with this? Once you have graphs and charts and fun things, what do you do with it? Um, and more so than me trying to uh, analyze uh, something, I just I found a, a few examples that would be helpful uh, for you. And I do have a bibliography at the end of, um, of this as well. Um, so I mentioned differential reading. Uh, Tanya Clement actually has a really good description of her process of differ differential reading. Uh, when she looked at The Making of America by Gertrude Stein. Um, so she started out with the text of Stein's novel, and then she uh, put together a representative sample of um, contemporary authors, and she compared, um, she compared her text to, to that corpus, um, and she found some really interesting things uh, that, like uh, Stein, employs a lot of um, repetition. So why would that be? And that brought her to a close reading, a closer reading of Stein's uh, Stein's work itself. Um, so she talks uh, a little bit about her process. Um, Rubicki give uh, provides um, three different examples of different levels um, of analysis. So looking at um, in terms of the small scale, trying to differentiate the authors in a co-authored novel. Um, in the middle uh, example, they actually uh, analyze high school exit exams. Uh, so what's, what characterizes uh, highly scored exams and what characterizes uh, low scored exams. Um, and then for their macro, their large scale analysis, they look at, um, what was it? It was 300 years of English novels, of English mm -hmm. language novels. Everything from Swift to, um, to uh, Shades of Grey. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting uh, sample. And then as a really good example of the tool that we'll use today and a really quick uh, showcase, MRA libraries actually put together, um, they, they analyze, they have a collection of sermons uh, delivered on the death of President Lincoln. And so they chose uh, a couple examples of those and they did a really good um, analysis of, of, of some of those. I'm gonna provide you with the link there. Um, so if you're curious about what scholars have done uh, with text analysis with these tools, uh, you can take a look at these. I will also point out that Clement uses Voyant as one of the tools uh, that, that uh, she used in her analysis too. So you have examples to, to go home with. So we know kind of what text analysis is. Um, we. We have some examples of how it can be used. So the next step is doing it ourselves. So how do we how do we get started, right? Um, and the process that was followed that was followed by the scholars that we just talked about that will follow um, today is pretty basic. There's roughly four steps. They don't necessarily happen in exactly this order, but this is a pretty good order to start with. Um, the first step is find your text. Find what you want to analyze, acquire a corpus. Um, and there's many different sources. There are open sources. That's actually what I went with uh, today. I tried to find sources that were openly available so that when I, um, when I make this presentation and these documents available, anybody uh, can, can use it. So I chose uh, two, two texts, two flood myths from Gutenberg Books and the Internet Archive. Um, and then uh, a body of um, uh, narratives of, of uh, former slaves from the document in the American South Project out of UNC Chapel Hill. All of these, again, are openly available. There are, you know, um, um, more restricted uh, 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 sources. Uh, for instance, some of the databases that the library offers, you can actually get a, a text mining file. Uh, to use, so some of the, the newspaper sources that we've recently acquired um, have that available. We're just working on how to make it available to our community. Um, so uh, it never hurts to ask, I guess, is if you if you know what you want to work with, uh, we can kind of try to help you find um, 
decide where it might be feasible and how it might be feasible. Um, so that, that, uh, that's the first step, finding what you want to work with. The next step is, is pretty, uh, pretty important and can be kind of time intensive. Um, and that is preparing that text, preparing it, getting it clean enough and in the right format to be able to plug it into the tool that you choose. Um, and in terms of preparing it, it could be as simple as making sure it's in the right format, maybe uh, uh, changing the format of the file. Um, you might have to do things like remove extra information. So for instance, the file of the Genesis flood myth that I chose had the, you know, the biblical uh, uh, chapter headings, the, the verse headings um, for each, each verse. And that was too much. I thought it was going to throw off the analysis, so I had to go through, uh, scrape that out, uh, delete that from the file. It could also be cleaning up poor OCR. So most of the text, um, most of the text files that you will find, um, usually, unless the item itself was born digital, it was born as a digital file, usually it's a, it comes from a, a graphic scan an image scan of a printed page, a physical page that then you apply optical character recognition to, uh, to pull out the text. And that can be, uh, that can be, uh, the OCR technology uh, is not always the, the, the highest quality, so you might have to, you might have to clean that up. So for instance, uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh translation of the, of the flood myth from the Epic of Gilgamesh that I found on the Internet Archive, um, the main figure in that in that story is Utnapishtim, um, kind of important, right? And if you want to look at that, look at that flood myth, um, his name didn't appear in the same way twice in the entire in the entire translation. Um, luckily, he doesn't; he's not referred to a ton. So it, I just did a control find to alter it to to just uh, standardize the the name form uh, for that. So that, um, I think, uh, be prepared once you, if you get inspired about text analysis when you leave here, I just want to prepare you that um, these two steps especially can be time intensive. Uh, so if you, get, if you get kind of stuck in the, in the bog of cleaning up your, your text, um, you are not alone. Don't get discouraged. Um, there is a, a, a bright light on the, on the other side. Um, and I do want to point out everything in blue um, I've already I've already done for you, right? So I've selected the text, I've prepared it um, for us to analyze, and I've chosen uh, Voyant as our as the tool that we'll be using today because it's um, it's pretty easy to get started with. Um, it has a pretty low uh, barrier of entry, um, and it offers uh, a, a variety of tools uh, that you can play around with. So if you're new to to text analysis, uh, you have lots of things that you can you can sort of poke around with it and see, see what they do. Um, you get to do the fun part, which is analyze the results. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully we'll have a, have a little bit of fun with that. Um, are there any questions before we move into going out? Okay. Then we'll go ahead. Um, tell you a little bit about Moyan, and then we'll go ahead and get started with our, with our exercise. Um, there are essentially two versions of Voyant. One is a web-based uh, interface. You just go to voyant-tools.org and you start plugging stuff in, and voila, um, which is what we'll, we'll start with. Um, that is connected to a remote server, so it's a, it's a server that uh, Voyant folks maintain and provide access to. Um, and it's great, this version is great for smaller analysis, so smaller bodies of text. Uh, if you wanted to do a larger corpus, like maybe almost 300 narratives um, that we're going to do from the, the North American Slave Narratives uh, collection, um, you probably want to use the other version, which is where you install a server that will run on your computer. It just means that you don't have to worry about your internet connection to the remote server. You don't have to worry about how many other people are using the server at the same time that you are. Uh, you have control over the capacity and, and who's using uh, your local server. So other than, other than that, there's not that much difference between them. It's just sort of how much information or how much uh, data you want to run through, run through my app. So uh, go ahead. Uh, I've given you a link to a, a Google folder 
Hopefully, does that open up for, for you yes. all? Okay, good. Um, go ahead and follow that. That has the this PowerPoint slide, uh, or PowerPoint presentation. It also has the uh, a doc that has our exercise uh, in it. And I, before I leave this PowerPoint, I just want to point out that you do have here the, the reading list um, that includes the citations that I've already uh, mentioned in the, in the presentation, as well as a couple other things for if you are very excited and, and want to delve into uh, uh, text analysis. So, so can I see the link again? Also? Oh, yeah. yeah. It is also um, up here, oh. uh, but it's probably hard to see. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm going to buy it for this. <laughs> it's just sort of bitly and then discover DH without the, uh, without the vowels. Yes. <laughs> DSC VRDH4. The first thing that we'll need uh, when we're working uh, with Voyant is the actual documents that we'll be working with. So I put those into a um, into a Dropbox folder. So if you want to go to the little bit.ly uh, link that's listed under data. Can you make it 125 or 150? Thank you. Thanks. Um, so if you just want to open up the uh, Dropbox folder and go ahead and put those files on your computer somewhere where they'll be handy to, to get at, uh, easy to find when we upload them to, to Voyant. And if you haven't done so already, under Voyant, to download or not to download, option two has the link where you can download uh, the Voyant server. Uh, first, we're going to use the, the easier, the, the, the web-based tool, and then second, we're going to use the, the server option. Um, so take a moment to do that, and I will give you guys time to work, and I will troubleshoot here. So we'll go ahead and get started with the exercise. I do have this, the document is pretty detailed, um, so that later on, if you want to try it again, or, or try it on a different computer, uh, you can do that as well. Um, so for exercise one, uh, we start by downloading the files, but hopefully you've already done that. And then we just go to voyant-tools.org by the link there. Hopefully the internet gods are with us and the wireless is working for us all. Um, so this is the, the main interface uh, for Voyant. Uh, what we want to do um, at this point uh, is just, it's pretty simple, it's just like uploading a file um, other places, you just click upload. Um, I will point out the open option, they have pre-provided cor 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 corpora uh, that you can use, uh, so if you wanted to experiment with something other than what we have today, uh, you can use their, their text if you wanted to. So they have Shakespeare and Austin. Um, that's not what we're gonna work with today. Uh, we're gonna use the upload option um, and mine went directly to the file with my with the files that I'm interested in. Uh, but go ahead and navigate to wherever you have those files saved. Um, I'm going to highlight both the flood myths, so Genesis and Gilgamesh, uh, the two text files. I'm not going to do the slave narrative file right now. I'm going to click open, and it'll start processing. So this is. The, main, the, the default view of, of Voyant, you see we have five panels that we can, we can work with. Um, we have a lovely word cloud here. Uh, down here is a nice summary of our, of our documents. I don't know if I can make this make it bigger. Um, down here is our summary uh, view. Uh, so it will tell us things like which one is the longest, which is the shortest, uh, what's the, uh, which has the, the highest vocabulary density, um, what are the most frequent, frequent words in the corpus, the five most frequent, fre goodness, frequent words, uh, but then it also has uh, what's distinctive about each, each uh, document uh, in, the, in the corpus as well. You also, in the center uh, reader panel, uh, you just have the full text of all the documents that you've put in. Uh, so you can go through and look at them. Um, you also have a, uh, a sort of, uh, uh, the right below the text in the reader is, is a sort of a word frequency chart throughout the, the, 
the course of, of, the, of the text. So the first thing, once you enter information into Voyant, um, and after you've gotten over kind of being dazzled by all the, the information that's presented to you, the first thing you actually want to do, and I'm going to go ahead and make the word cloud a little bit bigger. I can just uh, click and drag the, the, um, the uh, panels uh, here. Uh, what I want to do is actually just take a look here, and I like to use the word cloud for this because it's you know nice and graphic, um, and see if there's any words that I'm not interested in that are kind of throwing off the analysis. Uh, the nice thing about the, they just updated going out over the summer, so now it actually automatically applies a stop word list, so you notice we don't have words like the, a, and. Um, but we do still have some words here that I might not be interested in. So for, for instance, just for the sake of argument today, I'm not really interested in shall, so I want to get rid of that from my analysis. So to do that, um, I'm just in the Sears panel, as an example, I go up to this little question mark here. And that opens up a tool uh, menu option. The question mark is a, is a help icon. It also gives you a description of what each, each tool is and is doing. Um, right next to that is a little, I'm not really sure exactly what the icon is, I think it's a little slider button. Um, that will open up an options menu. Um, and that gives us options for the stop word list um, that, that we use. You can also actually switch and instead of identifying words that you want to keep out of the analysis, you can use a white list, which will actually just identify the words that you want Voyant to focus on. Um, so if there, there's a select list of things that you're really interested in, um, you can use the white list instead of the stop list. For right now, we're just going to do the deal with the stop list, a uh, stop word list. Um, notice it's auto-detected. Uh, it automatically applied a stop list for us. But I want to add a new word to that. So I'm going to click on edit list next to stop words. Um, that opens up a little editor uh, window. I'm going to hit enter and I'm going to type in shall, because that's the word that I want to get rid of for right now. Um, on a new, just make sure it's on a new line uh, there. And I'm going to hit save. And before I hit confirm, I'm going to make sure that the checkbox next to apply globally is checked. It should be by default, but I just want to make sure. Um, that will make sure that this change is applied to all the windows, all the panels. Um, instead of just the uh, Cirrus panel, which is the one uh, that I'm in right now. So I'm going to hit confirm. And that should update the entire thing. Just give it a second. Notice right away my word cloud shall has gone away. Um, if I look, if I bring up the summary uh, pane a little bit, shall had been one of the most frequent words in the corpus and now it's gone. Um, so it has definitely updated um, in, in the rest of the windows as well. You, um, in the uh, little tools uh, menu in the upper right hand corner, you do have a few other options. Um, the little four, almost like a windows uh, icon, four pane uh, thing there, uh, that is, uh, an option, uh, a menu to choose different uh, tools, so you can replace each panel with a different uh, tool. You have, I think, I forget how many, but you have over a dozen tools, I think, that you can, you can choose from. Um, you also, you'll notice that you also can switch, uh, they have like little tabs that you can switch uh, for, some of the, for some of the panels as well. Um, so you can either use those those tabs, or you can use this replace icon. Um, the last icon is allows you to export a panel, export the, the graph or chart or text um, that you that you have um, that you've got prepared, and you can do it as kind of a live uh, view that includes the tools and the data, or you can just export essentially a, a static image um, of the of the thing. All right. So at this point, um, you're free to kind of explore. I'll maybe give you 
you like 10 minutes uh, to explore with, um, with what we have here. Um, you'll notice uh, one thing uh, that's handy, uh, again, with the word cloud, is if there's a term that you're interested in here, you can, let's say I'm interested in waters, I can click on the term in the word cloud, and it will automatically, um, it will tell me over, um, water? It will tell me, um, or it should, this is what I was talking about earlier. You always want the technology to work when you're actually standing in front of people. Um, so what should happen when I click on one of these terms in the word cloud is that is that it should pop up. Sorry? Oh, at first did man instead of water. Yeah, and now it's doing earth instead of gods. Um, so it must... Um, what, when, as you click on things in the word cloud, what it, will, what it should be doing is searching for it in the reader, so it's highlighting the, the term that you're interested in. Um, it's also pulling it up in the trends uh, uh, chart as well. And uh, it can also pull it up in the context, although I can also search. There's a little search box in the context menu and some of the other uh, uh, um, panels as well. I can search for things, so I can type in gods and hit search, and it's going to pull up the term that I'm interested in the second in the center and uh, a little bit of text um, on either side to give me the context of where it appears. Um, so I'll let you I'll be quiet now and let you explore. Um, I will point out that under number nine, if you want to do kind of a targeted exploration, I give you a couple questions that you can, uh, that you can try to answer um, with the tools that's going on. So hopefully you all are having fun kind of exploring uh, what, what Boyan is doing. Um, I just wanted to point out uh, one of the ways that I addressed one of the questions that I provided you with um, about the, the uh, point of view, the, the uh, uh, of the two flood myths uh, between Noah and Hunapishtim is I actually used the reader uh, uh, panel and I just typed in the two names mm -hmm. there and I actually, what I what it kind of tickled me when I was exploring is you have these charts over how these graphs about where each of the names is used. Um, so the first one here is um, the uh, Genesis story, the, the flood of Noah. The second one is the Gilgamesh story, the flood of Um the, the Bible story, the Genesis story, is told in the, in the third person. So Noah's name appears you know, throughout the text, throughout the, the, uh, the story. But Utnapishtim is actually the one telling his own story in the Epic of Gilgamesh. So you only see his name at the beginning and at the very end, and it doesn't appear in the, in the middle. So I just thought that was a, a nice kind of visualization. That might be something to use uh, at, in, in the context of teaching, uh, or if you're trying to you know, analyze the, the, uh, the, the voice um, of, of a text. So uh, I'll also point out that what I did up here um, is I just plugged both texts in, both versions of the flood myth in, um, together and analyze them together. I noticed a couple of you uh, just put in one at a time, and that would be that's actually another way that you could analyze them. You can put in one text, you could uh, play around with what you find in Voyant, uh, export it to save the different visualizations or, or um, um, uh, text that you information that you that you find. Um, do the next one, do the same thing, and then compare them uh, side by side. Another way that you might do it is um, get together a larger corpus of other flood myths, maybe flood myths from around the world. Um, put that together um, and, and plug that in here to do a larger, a larger comparison as well. Is yeah. there an easy way to upload one more document once you have this open or not? You have to close it out and, and, uh, and do it again. Unfortunately, uh, it doesn't it doesn't let you add things uh, later. But it is pretty easy to upload things, so it's, uh, it's 
So uh, we have a little bit under 20 minutes left, so let's segue to exercise two, which uses the uh, installed server version of, of Voyant. So I'm actually going to close out my web-based uh, Voyant, uh, close that out, and then I'm going to open up. Mine's, of course, kind of buried. Uh, I'm going to open up my Voyant server. Uh, just navigate to the little icon, the little Java icon where it says Voyant Server, and I want 2.1 uh, is the current uh, version. And what you will come across first is the server window, and then it will automatically, once it gets up and running, it will automatically pop open a new uh, browser page. And it will look, this will look exactly the same as what we saw before with the web-based version, but it's not actually tied to that server on your local computer. So even though the front looks the same, the, the back um, the back end is, is different. Um, I do want to make a couple notes about this uh, server window. Uh, before you close it, do not close it um, until you hit stop server. That's the first thing to know, because if you don't do that, if you just hit the X button, uh, without stopping the server, it will continue to run and it will continue to eat up the memory uh, on your computer. Essentially, it takes up space on your on your computer, and you don't want it want it to do that. Um, so that's the most important thing. Uh, the next thing is uh, if you're going to be doing crunching a lot of data uh, with this version of of Voyant, you can actually adjust the amount of of uh, memory that you give give the server, the amount of space essentially that you have uh, to do to crunch the data. And the way that you do that is you stop the server. I'm actually going to go ahead and increase the amount of, of memory here for uh, what we're going to do on this exercise. I'm going to hit stop server. You notice that it immediately changes to start server. Um, and then I'm going to go into the memory box and I'll just double the memory to 20, 2048 uh, megabytes. And then I will hit start server to start it up again. It's going to open up a new uh, browser window, so I will go ahead and close the old one. So there we go. Now I'm ready to go and I have a little bit more memory uh, to crunch the next project. Are there any, any questions about the server window so far? Okay. So just like before, uh, we want to upload text into Voyant, so I'm going to click the upload option, but this time instead of the flood myths, I'm going to uh, click on the compressed uh, slave narratives folder. Um, you do have to, it does, um, if you're uploading a folder into Voyant, it does need to be compressed, it needs to be zipped. Um, I, uh, I, I learned that the hard way, so I'm sharing uh, that with you. So, uh, <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> yes. Um, so go ahead and uh, click on the compressed folder and hit open. And this will take a little bit longer uh, than the first, uh, the first uh, exercise that we did just because we went from two documents to somewhere between 250 and 300 documents. I can't remember exactly, but it's, it's a lot more. Um, so it just takes it a little bit longer. And who doesn't have this running on one server on with me? Um, if someone doesn't have their way on server up and running, they can follow up with, with Sarah. Is anybody running into any trouble up to this this point? Yeah. Okay, good. I'd like to hear that. There we go. All right, and it looks pretty much the same. Um, you'll have access to the same tools that you that you had before. Um, you still have your your um, uh, tabs that you can uh, navigate between, but you also have your replacement uh, menu that you can uh, look through, menus of, of tool options that you can replace. Um, oops. Uh, it looks, again, looks very similar, but 
the back end is, is very different. So this is just an example of what it looks like when you have a lot of text in, um, in Voyant. If you uh, look, probably the biggest, just visually the biggest difference for us might be this trends chart. There's a lot more uh, 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 points on the graph now. Um, but if you look in the summary pane, in the lower right-hand corner, just going to make this bigger too, um, you notice that uh, we have a longer list under distinctive words. We actually have a much longer list here. Um, and it, oh, there's the exact number, 284 documents is what we have in this collection. Um, and you can look in them, you can just add, uh, you can look in the, at them in 10 document increments there to see what would be distinctive words in each of the narratives. other stuff. Um, what's interesting here when you have multiple files, um, you can choose, say, one of these uh, files listed in, under distinctive words, uh, whichever one kind of looks uh, interesting to you. So let's see. I'll do the uh, number two. Uh, on mine, it's uh, FPN Ball Ball. It's the file name, and I just clicked on the file name. That pulls it up in the, the reader, um, so that I can read that particular file, read through what's being said there, maybe get a little bit of, of context. Um, it also actually uh, changed, I think, Um, it also changed, or should have changed, the, the document, uh, the number of documents read in the trends uh, panel as well. And if it didn't, I can just click on the scale uh, menu in the, in the trends uh, graph. Right now, it is selected to look at the full corpus, the entire uh, 284 uh, documents. But if I switch to documents, it will give me a list of all the documents um, uh, in the system, and I can oops, I can select the FPN ball ball, which is the, the document that I highlighted in the um, summary pane. Click on that. It should. All right, so now it's just showing me that document, the word frequencies, the word frequency trends, excuse me, for that document. Um, right now it's looking at master, time, day, night, house. I could change um, that. So if I look at the distinctive words, I see that uh, fishery is, is a distinctive word. Uh, cotton is another distinctive word that happens, that has a high, um, has a high occurrence rate, so I'll go ahead, I can use the search box and type in cotton. And it will show me um, how often cotton appears and at which points uh, in the narrative um, mm -hmm. as well. So it's just an example of, of what you can do uh, with the time that we have left um, until just a couple minutes before the end of class. Go ahead and kind of play around. Uh, you can play around with the uh, server version if you don't have that installed. You can continue to play with the with the web version, um, and just like with the uh, flood stories, I give you a couple of um, prompts, some questions that you um, can try to answer uh, using using Voyant uh, with the uh, North American slave narratives as well. And as always, if you have questions, go ahead and, and raise your raise your hand. Um, I just wanted to, uh, to say, to remind you, if you are going to end uh, now or before you close down, uh, go ahead and hit stop server um, before closing down Voyant. That's, that's important. Um, I also uh, uh, wanted to say that you, you will have, you will continue to have this documentation um, at this link, the, the PowerPoint that I gave and uh, the instructions. Uh, so that you can work uh, on this later if you'd like or have a refresher uh, later. Um, I want to say thank you.
you all for, for coming. If you have uh, questions, uh, please let me know. And do you guys want to talk about the next yeah. series? I just had a quick announcement. I okay. wanted to let you all know that there are a couple things that we do regularly in the Office of Digital Research and Scholarship, including these workshops. One is the project, uh, or sorry, the, um, the percolator, which is every Wednesday afternoon from 3 to 5. Anyone is invited to come and bring your ideas, or you could come and play around with Boyant more and ask more detailed questions of us. Uh, come and talk about projects, come and talk about digital humanities, whatever you want. That time is always open. Just to note for this week, though, because we do have the um, second iteration right. of the same workshop, it's going to be cut short. Right. Um, so, uh, but every week other than this week, it's, right. it's a two hour. Uh, open office hours. But I really wanted to plug, we're doing a, a symposium this fall, November 17th and 18th, on, the title is Invisible Work in Digital Humanities. Uh, it's gonna, we're bringing three keynotes, kind of luminaries from uh, around the, the nation coming to talk to us about labor in the humanities and how we value one another's labor. Uh, so I'd encourage you all to register for that. It'll be right over here in the Bradley Reading Room, uh, November 17th and 18th. Uh, and all the information is online at iwdh.cci.msu.edu, or you can just Google Invisible Work at MSU, and that will come up. And one final thing, you may have seen a little slide notification. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, that, that was a good by, segue. By um, down there? Okay. Because uh, we also do have, we use Slack in the libraries to communicate, and for those of you um, who haven't been in previous sessions, we've been trying to get people onto um, the Digital Scholarship Slack, which is open to anyone in the FSU community, it's digiscolfsu.slack.com, um, and anyone with an FSU.edu account can sign up, um, and you can ask questions of us on there, of each other, um, you know, uh, talk about text encoding. Um, are you a member of the Digiscol one? Yep. This oh, is, yeah. th it's a different team. Oh, oh, okay. I need to invite you to that. Never mind. Um, <laughs> But so, get the idea yeah, yeah, it's basically just like a message board for talking about digital scholarship things. So please, please join and have yeah, good times on there in the incubator.